Howdy, howdy. Uh, on one of my videos, someone was like, I like watching the, the run cast because you get to see which headphones Sylvie's gonna be wearing. I have a couple of pairs of headphones. These ones, if you see me wearing these ones, these suck, all right? I left the gym on my run, and it's probably like, not even three kilometers in, they're like battery low, and then they just won't play anymore. I unplugged these in order to bring them to the gym. This is bull. Like, they should not be out of battery. Kevin and I are on a divide on this. So, Kevin likes to spend money on something that's good quality that will last a long time. So he bought me bone conducting headphones that are good for running because one, they don't hurt my ears, they don't slip, and I can still hear traffic, so they're not dangerous. So usually when you see those little red ones, those bone conductor ones, that's Kevin's school of thought. That's like, invest in it. Me and Carhat are actually on the same, <laughs> same end of the spectrum which is we want a certain degree of disposability afforded to us. So we like to buy things that are cheap so that if you sit on them or lose them or in Carhartt's case, leave them in a taxi, which is something he does a lot. I, these were like maybe $12 or something like that. I'm like, yeah, that's what I do. But the reason I have these actually is that they're big. I like to wear big headphones at the gym when I'm weightlifting because these send a signal of do not talk to me, which uh, if you have been raised and conditioned as a woman in the world, you know that that doesn't even necessarily keep people from talking to you, but it's a pretty good indicator to like, do not talk to me. Um, I'm reasonably friendly. Like there are a couple of, my gym is mostly men. There are a couple of men at the gym who are, you know, north of 60 uh, expats who we chat a little bit, you know, like sometimes you'll have to pop them off to be like, are you using this? Or uh, can I use that bar when you're done with it? Like that kind of thing. I'm reasonably nice. I'm not like a total asshole where I'm like, nobody can talk to me kind of thing. Um, but there are also people who, when you start talking to them, they just never stop. They just literally never stop. And I can't, I can't handle this. My dad, I'm very much like my dad. I've become more like my dad over the years. And uh, I kind of thought that when you become your parents, it was like a gradual thing. Like just kind of as you get older, you find more and more things that you're like your parents. It happens really fast. Like once I hit 35, I was just like woke up and I was like, my dad was crazy. But uh, my dad and I are not the same in this way. My dad is incredibly good, incredibly gifted, like gold medalist in small talk. If, uh, if he's gonna be seated next to someone for a long haul, like we flew to Germany, and he was just chatting to his seatmate the entire time, like just totally engrossed. And they never talked about anything other than like weather. Like, I don't think they got into politics. Like they totally just surfed small talk for like, it's like a 12 hour flight or something. It's incredible. My dad knows he's gonna be sitting next to someone. And within like five minutes, you look over and it's totally just like, did we just become best friends? <laughs> it's like crazy. I'm not like that. I didn't get that from my dad at all. I'm very, very shy. So. These are my, don't talk to me, I'm shy, headphones. And then fucking three kilometers into this run, they crapped out on me. So I still wear them. They're basically like um, <laughs> silent earmuffs for me while I'm running now. Uh, I put them back on when I'm running, but that is what it is. Um, I was talking to this guy who came to the gym. Uh, he's from the Philippines and he brought his daughters out. He has two daughters and a son whose son's too young to train. But he and his wife want to start a gym, like open a Muay Thai gym in the Philippines. And so they're talking about, you know, what they what they want to bring with Muay Thai and what kind of trainer they want to bring out and how the Philippines is really, you know, they have amazing boxing in the Philippines. So of course they have uh, boxing instructors there, but they want to really kind of bring in the Muay Thai element, this kind of thing. And uh, he's kind of talking about like what he would like in a traditional sense versus what is realistic for Manila and what he's gonna be able to open. And I had been thinking about this actually while Kevin was driving me over to the gym already. This kind of like, in order to be financially stable, let alone successful, you have to have some degree of like marketing. And your marketing has to be for a kind of safety net to like a common denominator. So this happened in Muay Thai gyms. Um, it's actually really, really hard to find a true Muay Thai gym anymore all over the place. Like I'm sure they still exist in Asan and out in the provinces and stuff like that. But like Bangkok, Pattaya, Chiang Mai, there are not real Muay Thai
Muay Thai gyms anymore. And when I say real Muay Thai gym, what I mean is that there are like kids who are filling the next cycle. They're going to be raised in the gym, made strong. And then you have, you know, uh, the, the fighters who are kind of the earners and this kind of thing. Almost all gyms now don't really have kids. They're full of Westerners. Like, Westerners outnumber ties in a lot of gyms, many, many, many gyms. And then you also have a lot of Westerners holding pads in gyms now. And this is not that they're like being hired on as pad men in most gym situations. This is more like they want to hold pads and so they do, but that's tolerated. Like that's just kind of like, oh, this is free labor. And so they, you know, the gym is like, sure, no problem. But you, you see it. This is like a completely, uh, it's not new. This was happening at Lana when I got here, but it's a growing phenomenon. And so, this is the like Thailand marketability. This is the like, we need Westerners to pay their dues, to train to fight here. And then maybe they take part of your purse when you fight in addition to that. And this kind of just keeps the gym running. This keeps the lights on, this keeps all of these things. And then you have Thai fighters on the Thai circuit that are kind of the more, uh, you know, traditional sense of how Muay Thai works, but they're no longer the thing that you're like fully invested in. When I first moved to Petron Rung here in Patia, which is only nine years ago, they had Westerners for sure. Like, there it goes. There were many, many Westerners at the gym. This was not a like full Thai gym, but they did not care about the Westerners. Like, you can train with us, you can do our program, that's fine. But what their bread and butter was, what they were interested in, what their heart and focus was, was Thai kids. They brought up some of the biggest names currently, uh, but over the past like seven years or so, some really, really big names that like were the up and comers just like blasting onto the scene, they all came out of Petron Rung. So PTT uh, was Petron Rung, he's on Thai fight. Jado Kam is now Taiwan Chai. Uh, Joseph and Alex are both at Jitmongnan, they were both from Petron Rung. Uh, it's it's significant. Pechi Jia was not trained at Petron Rung, like she was not one of their stable, but she trained with them. Her family lived at the gym, so you can't give Petron Rung credit for having brought her up, but she also was sharpening herself on the young Thai boys, the same guys who I was clinching and training with when I first got there, although she had already left at that point. And now the gym is just entirely Westerners. Uh, the owner of the gym, Kurnu, has said that he just doesn't want to deal with professional fighters anymore, and by that he actually means Thai fighters. Um, so he'll have like beginner Thai fighters, kind of like high-so or middle-class Thai fighters who can fight at max or something like this, but they're not professional. They just want experience. And then other than that, it's just all Westerners, uh, which is the same circuit. You put them on max, you put them on Thai fight, you put them on, you know, I don't know, super champ, some kind of three round thing. Uh, and you don't have to deal with the hassle and difficulty and sandy floor that is a real professional Muay Thai gym. Instead, it's this kind of marketable Western thing. So, this is just describing what the marketing element of Muay Thai gyms in Thailand are. Brought about by this guy in the Philippines talking about how he's going to have to balance the marketability of his gym with what he would want in a kind of pure sense. And uh, I think that this is something that Muay Thai is kind of struggling with identity-wise in its promotion, which is that you do need people getting through the gate and watching Muay Thai. That's what actually pays the bills. That's what keeps the lights on for promoters. That's what actually pays your fighters. The Kadua, which is the um, <coughs> purse that you pay each fighter, that generally comes from the gate. So you don't decide that based on what your gate is. You tell them what you're gonna pay them and then you hope to recoup that from your gate. And if people are not going to see live Muay Thai because they can watch it on their phone, they can watch it on Facebook, Everything is on TV or online now. Like every promotion is online. Um, people just aren't going. And those people are not paying to watch what they're watching. This is like totally the critical element of my generation because I'm old enough that I remember buying CDs. Like I remember buying my first CD, saving up my allowance, all of this stuff. I remember waiting for a song to come on on MTV because like you really wanted to hear it and you didn't just have it literally in your pocket that you can like look up and play at any time but when i was in um elementary school i think napster 
was kind of coming around and then it just started changing and then you got this whole Lars Olsrich thing with the, like stealing our music blah 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 and now you have like literally no one wants to pay for anything anymore uh industries have totally had to like readjust and make big changes in order to remain profitable and even in those situations not everyone remains profitable like i think that the way the music industry used to work is uh you would um tour in order to kind of like sell cds because that's where you were making money and now you basically come out with albums in order to tour because the only way you're going to make money is on tour which is totally like not how things were before it's completely inverted so i think that the way the musicians make money now has had to completely readjust and this is probably probably similar to how promoters now have to readjust how they're paying their fighters because where is that money coming from kind of thing um and so when you have to have a marketability factor you can't necessarily do what you think is actually the best promotion or actually the best thing and uh example I was giving to Kevin in the car on the way over was wine which is like if you own like a little chateau that just makes incredible wine like just so good you're gonna have small batch that's what you do and it's gonna be incredibly expensive every bottle is gonna be really expensive but people who know wine and sommeliers and people who like have invested great knowledge into this will know where to look they will find you they will buy it and people will pay a lot of money for each bottle of wine which kind of you know you're not going to be like heavily profitable that way but you remain afloat like it finds its way if you make huge batch like jammy wine that's like very friendly for people who don't really care that much about wine they just kind of want something red and sweet that they can like put at their party or something the way you make yourself stand out, your marketability for the common denominator is to like make your label kind of sexy or something. Like, I remember going to the liquor store with my mom for, um, I don't know, Thanksgiving or like kind of the few, the few celebrations throughout the year where we would go actually buy like a couple of bottles of wine or something like that. Um, and I totally remember as a kid being like, I like the, the label on this one. And I wasn't gonna be drinking it. I was like 14 or something. But I was like, I like the Ravens on this one. Let's get this one. And this is totally, I'm sure there are studies on this that like the label of your wine actually has an incredible impact on who buys what at that like lower level. And so there are like lower level Muay Thai or shows or whatever that you have to get some kind of gimmick or marketability in order to get people in there. There are these, I've never been to them. I don't want to talk too much shit because I don't know, but I've never actually heard good things about them. There's a show called uh, Raja Damner Knockout, um, and it is basically like free-flowing beer. Like, this is the marketability. That is not going for people who are like hardcore fans of Muay Thai. That's going for people who want to go drink a lot of beer and watch a show. So, oh, I know these people. This is, uh, this is where I ride my horses, and I know these doubtly. Hi, Sugar. Hi. on them and have them be disposable too. Uh, people will totally promote more disposable shows <laughs> and make money off of that versus the like super high end we're just trying to break even but we're creating a really really good product. So thank you for coming to my economics economy TED talk and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.